Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt. Live in California. The story of your life indeed. Last night, I'm up with very little sleep this morning because we had a blast last night. I came out to California with the fetching Mrs. Hewitt so that we could celebrate with 300 of his closest friends and staff, family, admirers, donors, supporters, Governor Pete Wilson's career. Originally, we had scheduled this at the Nixon Foundation at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda for the 30th anniversary of Pete Wilson's inauguration as governor of California in 1991. And of course, the virus got in the way, so we postponed it to April, and then we postponed it until last night, uh, which was serendipitous from the perspective of the fetching Mrs. Hewitt and I, as we met for the first time on the same time I met Pete Wilson for the first time at a Pete Wilson fundraiser at Mission Bay, hosted by the San Diego Young Republicans in 1978. You know, I was the uh, wet behind the ears Ohio kid thinking, no, oh, this is a pretty good place. Look at all these cute girls and that one over there. And Pete Wilson was working the crowd. The only campaign out of 10, Pete went 10 for 11. And the one that he lost was the one that I won because he had an event in which I met the fetching Mrs. Hewitt. But we worked with Bob White, his longtime chief of staff, and the room was full and rocking yesterday. Great reception. The governor was there, Mrs. Wilson. Gail Wilson is a star. People who live in Washington, D.C. and who knew Gail from Pete Wilson's time in the Senate. Remember, Pete is a Marine. He's a Yaley, but we, we leapt over that. He's a Marine. Enlisted, became an officer. His older brother led him there. His older brother, the enlisted man, who said, you know, I'll break your arm if you join the Marines. And Pete did anyway, right out of Yale. After that, law school. After that, advance work for a young Richard Nixon running for California governor in 1962. That didn't work out well for President Nixon, but eventually it did for the country and for President Nixon. Then Pete went and became an assemblyman. Then he became the mayor of San Diego for 12 years. Then he became the United States Senator for eight years, and then he became the governor of California for eight years. He was a great governor, he was a great senator, largely responsible along with Dan Quayle and Ronald Reagan for the passage of Star Wars, SDI, which many credit with the collapse of the Soviet Union, finally. Uh, governor Wilson was just in fine fettle. He doesn't change, he doesn't age, he's the same guy. And uh, there is a, you know, tribute videos are a funny thing. They can either be terrible or great. This was great. Um, the people who did little two-minute clips, I may play it next hour, uh, were Jim Baker, the former Secretary of State and another Ivy Leaguer Marine turned extraordinary public servant, Mitch McConnell, master of the Senate. Uh, we had Tom Cotton and Mike Pompeo representing the next generation. Of course, Pete knows them both, admires them both. Elaine Chow, with whom Gail Wilson was close when they were in the Senate together. Constant Towers of Gavin, who many people will remember as being the, the social leader of Washington in the Reagan years. Uh, the Honorable George W. Bush, President Bush, had some kind and funny words for Pete Wilson. And Dan Quayle was actually the funniest of them all. I'll play that video a little bit later. And then just a tribute to him. We had a grand old time. And I, I'm here to tell you. Don't wait around to honor people until they've, after they've gone to their great reward in the sky. Do it when their family, friends, and, uh, and colleagues can join it, because it was a blast of a party. And it was not a fundraiser. It wasn't a friend raiser. It was nothing other than come to the Nixon Library, and we're just going to toast Pete. And we did. And amazingly, we had six speakers hold to a, roughly hold to a four-minute margin. And they made everybody laugh, because they didn't go over the same bio I just gave you. So it's, it's a, everybody knows Pete Wilson's bio, but they don't make them like that anymore. California has produced one president who had been a governor, Ronald Reagan, one president who had been a senator and a vice president, Richard Nixon, produced one governor who became the chief justice, Earl Warren, and only one governor who was a senator in the modern era, Pete Wilson, and also a mayor of America's finest city, San Diego. So it was a great night last night, but it went late. And I, I bolted out of there, and Pete was never, he might still be there shaking hands, because you get 300 of your old staff together, and your old friends, and your old donors, and your old supporters, and your campaign gurus, and Bob White's there, he hadn't seen people like this. Bob White's a legend in California, he's absolutely a legend, uh, as being the man. He's sort of like, as Jim Baker was to Ronald Reagan, Bob White was to Pete Wilson. And if you don't know anything about Pete Wilson, you will not understand. A lot of people haul up a lot of different things as his greatest achievement. The single thing was with the Northridge earthquake, you know, my first big one was Northridge. 
and I'm clutching the kids upstairs when everything is falling apart. It was a Dwayne, were you around for Northridge? Where were you for Northridge? That was a what the earthquake? Yeah. Oh, I, uh, I that's where I kind of started my uh, my career in radio was in Los Angeles for a show on KKLA, uh, Warren Duffy's Live from LA show. Uh, the North earthquake had just happened when he went on the air. So you see, that was that was genuinely disaster. That was 90, 94, 94, 95, radio. right? Yeah, and that's when the ten fell down. And people, the the Interstate 10, or as we say, the 10. No, you mean California. you mean the 14, right? Wasn't it the 14? No, no, going the 14 Lancaster? fell down too, but the 10 fell down in West Los Angeles. Right. And that part of the 10 is the most traveled highway in America. And all of the experts said, well, we'll see in about five years. And Pete Wilson said, I have this constitution here that says I have emergency powers. And so here's the trick Jaeger Construction, which is the biggest deal. I'm giving you a contract, and moreover, I am going to, you got to get it done in 90 days, which everyone thought was a joke. And moreover, I'm paying you a million or $2 million a day for every day that you finish early. Guess who finished early? Oh, yeah. Put uh, it back, yeah. I think he wrote it on the back of a napkin. You, you, put, a, you put a bounty on it, and all you of a sudden, it, boom, it gets tw done. 24-7, they, they made it happen. He did, he did that with the 14 flyover from the 5 on the way to Lancaster. Yeah, he did. It, was that, it was a bad earthquake, but Pete handled that. He handled the riots yeah. in L.A. He did three strikes. He did uh, welfare reform. He did pension reform. If they'd left it alone, California wouldn't be broke today. California would be great again. He formed these red teams. He flew all over the country and got people to tell the Democrats who are running Sacramento legislature and Willie Brown, why they wouldn't open another plant in California and they finally got medicine. Really, the last great governor this state has had. Absolutely. And it's, and it's decades ago. Absolutely. And Pete used to bang the hell out of me and I used to bang the hell out of Pete. But I always said, not for Pete Wilson, no fetching Mrs. Hewitt. And we had a grand old time last night. And Pete Wilson is, I guess, 80, 80. He looks like he's 60. It's not like Joe Biden. It's the other way around. Joe Biden ought to be having dinners honoring him, and Pete ought to be in the White House. In fact, Dan Quayle, I might play that later, but let me do the news. Let me do the news. We just had a grand old time. Pete Wilson, a great man. Gail Wilson is a wonderful woman. Great first lady and great governor of California. Pfizer booster is now available for me. I'm 65. If you're 65 and older, wandering your CBS, show them the card that you got the uh, vaccine six months ago. You don't need it before six months. And in a, in a great move, Finally, Rachel Walensky, the CDC director, did something right. And they had one of these endless bureaucracy advisory councils that said, we don't think we ought to really give boosters to teachers and frontline workers and doctors. And she said, you know what? Joe Biden's the president of this country, and he appointed me, and he wants everyone to get the booster. So we're giving them to frontline workers, too. And they blew them all off. Good for you, Doc. I mean... This is a free country. If somebody wants the booster, go get the booster. And if you're over 65, they won't even give you a, ha a hassle about it. And it's great. You're not going to die if you get the booster. You're not going to have a bad reaction. There might be one person out there. You probably would have been run over by a truck or gotten hit by a safe falling or had Wiley e. Coyote hit you in the head either. Go get the booster. Nancy Pelosi concedes last night that, that Mitch has beaten her. Kevin and Mitch have beaten Nancy and Chuck. She says the government funding won't lapse. So they're doing the fire drill. They passed the debt limit with a, a continuing resolution. And that's going to not make it through the Senate. But then they're going to go back in because they realize they're going to have to amend the, the budget in order to include the ability to pass the debt ceiling unilaterally. The Democrats have the power. I just love that. I, and they have all these, oh, look, default looms, default. It's not going to loom. By the way, the Democrats embarrass the squad. They got so much heat from the Friends of Israel, both Republicans and Democrats. They took a billion-dollar bill to the floor yesterday and rolled over the squad. AOC was crying on the floor. 120,000 Afghans were evacuated through Kabul Airport last month. And still the Biden administration... It, but she was crying on the floor, and uh, who else was crying? Uh, Representative Jayapal was crying, and they, oh, it was a day for tears for Democrats. Great day for Republicans yesterday. And the Arizona election audit says, indeed, Joe Biden won Arizona, but we knew that. Come right back, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. It's a Friday on the Hugh Hewitt Show. That means it's time first for the movies with Sonny Bunch. He, uh, across the movie aisle fame, the dispatch goes to the movies. Not the dispatch, the bulwark goes to the movies. Good morning, Sonny Bunch. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Hugh? Well, good. You warned me off from Cry Havoc, but I liked it anyway. So... 
I'm not sure whether or not to trust you this week, but have you got anything for us? Wait, what? What did I warn you off of that you? Liked? You weren't very. You weren't not. You were. You weren't very excited about uh, Cry Macho. Oh, Cry Macho. Yeah. I mean, it's. I, I liked it. It's. It's fine. It's fine. It, it, like the again, my my big problem with this movie is that I just don't. I don't believe Clint Eastwood. Uh, on a on a Bronco. At that, at, at that age, doing but doing doing a lot of things in that movie. I mean, I just it, there there's there, he's just too old for it. I, I thought of that last night when when we were honoring Pete Wilson on the 30th anniversary of the occasion of his first year as governor, and there was a picture of he and Clint, and it was 30 years ago. Clint Clint could have that done that Bronco. So let's forget about Cry Macho and tell me instead what do we see this weekend, Sonny? Uh, well, there there are a couple of things in the theater you could go check out. Uh, there there's a uh, a new movie about Tammy Faye Baker called The Eyes of Tammy Faye, uh, starring Jessica Chastain as Tammy Faye Baker uh, and Andrew Garfield as Jim Baker, um, which is kind of interesting. I don't think it's very good. Um, it it the movie doesn't really work for me uh, huh? because it is it's kind of structured. So the, the, again, it's it's about Tammy Faye Baker. It's about her her. Uh, her life and her kind of rise and fall and the the, the rise and fall of televangelism um, just as a, as a general matter. Um, and, and again, I, I don't think the movie is very good because it, it is kind of structured like a it's structured like a musical biopic. You, it's like you know one of these huh. uh, movies that uh, like Bohemian Rhapsody or um, or Ray or uh, you know what there's there's a million of them. Respect, which is in theaters right now. Sure, there's, there's a million of these movies that where, where you have a very basic structure to it. Elvis Presley, is, yep. Rise, yeah, fall, like, rise again. Yep. Right, exactly. It's you. You have a you have a rough childhood, which leads to somebody wanting to become a performer, uh, which leads to them finding success, which leads to them being becoming addicted to drugs. Uh, Billy Holiday, you betcha. Falling then. You know, I mean, it's it's a very it's a very very predictable structure, and for some reason, uh, they the the filmmakers have decided to follow that structure exactly for uh, the eyes of Tammy Faye. Um, and again, it, it, this it, this is so predictable that it like is it, it's almost weirdly like a parody. It's almost like, like a parody of these these sorts of things. So again, I, I don't think the movie really works. Um, Jessica Chastain tries real hard in it. Uh, she has a lot of uh, what I would describe as theater kid energy, uh, which is she, which which is to say that she is acting. She's doing a lot of acting in this movie. She's very expressive and um, yeah. You know, as was very, Tammy like, Faye. Can do it. As was as, Tammy Faye. As with Tammy Faye, but that's that's why it works. I mean, that's why her performance here works and doesn't just feel. Uh, feel like a like a bundle of nerves and energy, like like it's high school musical. Band. Yeah, no high school music. So, you know, look, I, I again, I don't, I, I can't really recommend this movie. I don't think it's, I don't think it's great. Uh, but she is interesting in it. I like Andrew Garfield in it. The weirdest performance is Vincent D'Onofrio as Jerry Falwell, who huh. is playing, who's playing Jerry Falwell almost like he's Dick Cheney. He's very clipped and very, you know. Uh, Stentorian. It's it's a very weird. It's a very weird performance from him. Um, but you know, I, 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 I again can't really recommend this movie. It might be worth checking out if you're uh, if if you remember this period in history, just to kind of see how uh, Hollywood wants to portray it in theaters, uh, which obviously is not hundred uh, percent terribly terribly. Is there flattering. anything else though we can see now? The Browns are playing the Bears on Sunday, so I don't need and the and the Ohio State Buckeyes are playing the Akron Zips tomorrow. So I got I got alternatives if there's nothing some, to see. Yeah. Well, I like uh, there's there's a movie out now. Uh, it actually came out last weekend, but it, it didn't it didn't screen at least for me for critics um, uh, called Cop Shop Q, uh, and it's this is I've it, seen the preview. Stars, yeah. It stars it stars Gerard Butler um, as uh, as this this kind of hitman named Bob Vidic. Um, he is on the uh, he is chasing Frank Grillo, uh, whose character is Teddy Moretto, and Teddy is a uh, fixer for the Las Vegas mob slash casinos. They're kind of one and the same, as we as we all know, or at least used to be. I, used I to be. Used this to be. This movie is this movie no is slanders. slightly anachronistic yeah. Yeah. Um, in that regard. But uh, so this is uh, directed by Joe Carnahan, who directed The Gray. Um, he directed the A Team uh, remake, 
reboot whatever for movies uh, ten years ago or so. Um, and he's he's made a bunch of movies I actually really like. Uh, and I'm I'm kind of surprised that this movie has gotten so buried. It hasn't gotten a ton of promo. He is not doing any press for it. Apparently, he and Frank Grillo were kind of mad about how the studio cut his. Uh, cut Frank Grillo's character, but I like it a lot. I like is there a lot, lot of Las Vegas? I love Las Vegas movies. I love Nevada movies. I was talking about Nevada yesterday. Adam Laxalt, their former attorney general, is running for Senate and should win. And uh, and they, whenever you do that, the grifters in, L- in Las Vegas come out and attack the good guys. And so some of the grifters came out and attacked at Adam. Cause, you know, Vegas is just full of grifters. Everybody's on yeah. the take. And so some of them came out and attacked Adam Laxalt yesterday. And then the uh, the former journalist now Flack. Uh, John Ralston came out and attacked Adam. Uh, you know, I think he, uh, he he's just on the Democrats team. But Las Vegas, you turn over any rock and people come out. Is there Vegas through this movie? I go see every Vegas movie. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's set in it's set in Nevada, and there there is a, a scene early on that is in a casino. It's very funny. I don't want to spoil it, but it it, it kicks off the movie in a very entertaining and amusing way. Um, but it's not really a Vegas movie. It's more like Rio Bravo, uh, is how I would describe it, or Assault on Precinct 13. So the, what 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 essentially happens in this movie is that uh, Frank Grillo's character, Teddy Moretto, he uh, gets himself arrested on purpose to try and avoid uh, being killed by the people who are out to get him. But they all wind up in the same jail, jail with him. And it's a, it's a, it's a battle to survive, to, to kind of make it through the night. Um, again, I, it, it is, it is set in Vegas. It has a lot of kind of Vegas trappings, corruption. And, you know, uh, like I said, there is a scene in, in a casino, uh, and there is a lot of talk about, you know, the, the Vegas poles and the grifters and all of the, the, you know, gr- the palms that need to be greased. Uh, but I, I, I would not really describe it as a Vegas movie. This is not ocean 13, right? This or ocean's 11. This is, a. Uh, but this it's a good a, solid B. It's but it's it's a solid it's a solid B B plus movie. It's a B movie, is what it is. I mean, it is a big action adventure movie. I want to spe- I want to specifically shout out uh, two two actors in this. Toby Huss. I don't know if you know who Toby Huss is. I do not. Is, uh, but he is a he's a he's a great character actor. He's been in a ton of stuff. Um, but he plays this kind of psychopathic killer with a southern accent that is just really it's he's a very funny character i i I love him in this uh and alexis louder who i've never who i've never seen before in anything but she plays the good cop um and she just has a steely uh steely gaze to her she's got a she's got a backbone i i love her in this movie um, but if it should be playing near you because it's in 3,000 screens somehow. Well, I'm telling you, Sonny, you sold me on this. And so uh, I've got a movie to see. Sonny Bunch has done his job. Give five charts. Uh, by the way, did you review it in Across the Movie Aisle? Uh, we didn't. We didn't review it because, again, we, we, we kind of weren't sure when it was coming out. We didn't really, we weren't 100% uh, sure what was going on with it. There's Is it in the bulwark goes to the out. movies? Uh, well, I'm uh, I'm I'm writing a, a, a fairly longish piece about it today. I'll I'll uh, and Joe Carnahan's work in general. I'll tweet it out at uh, at some point this morning once it goes up. But uh, All right. yeah, All look right. for that. Folks, I will. Well, Sonny that. Bunch, as always, uh, you've given me something to work with, and I appreciate it, my friend. Follow Sonny on Twitter at Sonny Bunch. Watch both of his podcasts or listen to both his podcasts across the movie aisle, and the ball work goes to the movies. Sonny Bunch, thank you. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt in California. About to fly back tomorrow. I'll have to watch the Akron-Ohio State game on the plane. I hope I can get enough bandwidth on that. Joined by Doug Maurice, He, along with Shahan Raja, hosts the College Football Playoff Podcast Show. And I got to tell you, the College Football Playoff Show on Apple Podcasts or wherever they're available. And I really recommend the College Football Playoff Podcast. I really do. The Playoff Show is terrific. However... Doug also hosts Buckeye Talk, which is I'm addicted to. And I'm now very into this look behind the sports journalism world that you did a deep dive of four hours on, Doug. We'll come to the most important thing that happened in college football last week and what will happen this week. But that's really something. Anyone interested in sports journalism, having Steven say this is very different from the Kent State Journalism School was something. Good idea, well executed. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's there's, there's a world, Hugh, where people, they get on message boards and they share information and people sometimes, it's almost like gossip a little bit. 
and it's it's an important part of college football. And you can hear rumors, and our players going to be out, and that kind of thing. But it's it's not the same as writing for a newspaper or, or a website. But it's a huge part of college sports. It's interesting. It can be a little I don't know on the edge sometimes, but um, it's reality. And so yeah, it is a little bit of a journalism lesson for all of us. But um, it is I, it's a little bit almost like gossip magazines, but it can be really interesting. I strongly recommend. Ohio State's got like a dozen different sites that follow it, and Buckeye Podcast, Buckeye Talk Podcast is probably the most popular with Doug, Nathan, and Stephen. But they've done this four-hour deep dive into one super team's universe. It's like the Marvel Universe of Ohio State football. They recommend it to you. But let's get the College Football Playoff Show podcast. What was the most important thing that happened last week, Doug? Lay Maurice. Well, again, Hugh, the audience needs to know this. I came on last week and talked about this great quarterback from Florida who had a chance to maybe beat Alabama. He didn't play. He <laughs> didn't play. They played the other guy. But Florida still almost beat Alabama. And the interesting thing was Alabama looked a little vulnerable, and Alabama never looks vulnerable. So Alabama's not going to lose this week, but now that makes us look ahead to two weeks from now. They're going to play maybe the best quarterback in the country in Matt Corral of Old Miss. So Alabama survived last week, but now I'm very intrigued about what it's going to look like the next few weeks for Alabama. You know, if you talk to a Mississippi fan anywhere in the country, they'll always say, just wait until last century. Because Ole Miss is not mentioned, you know, had not mattered in 20 years. And I heard the podcast this week, so I got to start watching Ole Miss again because this quarterback sounds interesting. Yes. Uh, what really? is the most important college football game other than Ohio State and Akron, which does not feature C.J. Stroud? I hope there's an emergency Buckeye talk on that. What What is the most important game other than Ohio State Akron? Well, in, in the college football world now, Hugh, players can transfer and play immediately. Back several years ago and for a long time, you had to sit out a year when you transferred. So this week, Notre Dame and Wisconsin are playing in Soldier Field in Chicago, and the Notre Dame quarterback is Jack Cohn, who used to be the Wisconsin quarterback. Huh. So this is a really interesting head-to-head -head situation. You don't see it all that much. Jack Cohn was the veteran quarterback at Wisconsin. There was a younger quarterback named Graham Mertz who kind of came in and took over. So now they're playing each other head-to-head. -head. Notre Dame remains in our playoff conversation, but they've won three games by really close margins, and this time Wisconsin's favored by about a touchdown. So it's kind of a revenge game, or at least seen as old friends, for Notre Dame quarterback Jack Cohn. And if Notre Dame wants to stay in the playoff mix, they've got to win this game. They haven't looked great defensively the first three weeks. So a big neutral site game in Chicago. I thought you guys were close. You and Shahan, for the benefit of the audience that have not yet subscribed to the College Football Playoff Show podcast, and you should, the College Football Playoff Show podcast is very entertaining. The texters, along with Shahan and Doug, uh, have 12, up to 12 teams in the hunt for the playoffs, and they can boot someone out every week. They do boot someone out every week. I thought you were going to boot Notre Dame this week on the strength or actually lack of strength in their three tepid wins, but they hung on by their fingernails. They're not going to survive a close game with Wisconsin, I don't think, given the tenor of your voice. No, no, it's tough. I mean, they've played really tight games with Florida State. They almost lost to Toledo the other week, so... Notre Dame, we thought they'd have a great defense this year. They have one of the best defensive players in the country in Kyle Hamilton, but they they just haven't been that team. And so it'll, it'll be really interesting. They might need Jack Cohn, former Badger, to save them, which is just a fascinating storyline. But it's part of what college football is. You can transfer and be in another team in a year. You know, I got to go back and say very quickly, you paid a sideways compliment to the Tulsa quarterback last week compared him to the old uh, USC quarterback, Mark Sanchez. And so the guy took his helmet off. You were absolutely right. He was a central casting Oklahoma from down in the in the Plains states. He had a pretty good game, Doug. They scared us. Oh, no, the, the Ohio State defense is having lots of quarterbacks scare him right now. But again, <laughs> as you said, Ohio State, they're seven touchdown favorites against Akron, but their starting quarterback has a sore shoulder they're going to play some other guys. So at least something interesting to watch at Ohio State this week. 
Doug Maurice, thank you. Go watch the college football playoff show. The podcast is amazing. And Buckeye Talk, of course. Doug Maurice talks to you next week. Doug O'Neill, America. It's Friday. The Friday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show rolls along next. Joined now by the poet laureate of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Hello, Joe. Hello, you. I want to tell you something to reassure you about your influence as a radio personality. Oh. Nine, yes, nine out of ten of your listeners may disagree with you about the Republican cave, but I've been humming red rubber ball since Wednesday. <laughs> Tarzani Ohana says, if she hears, I'm not the only starfish in the sea one more time, I will be. <laughs> right, let's uh, go on with the poem. With the country in an uproar and big choices looming large, the left has just discovered that they're the ones in charge. They have the House and Senate and the Oval Office, too, Funny how they can't enact the things they said they'd do. I have but little sympathy for all the left's frustrations. They'll either have to raise the debt or lower expectations. But like their peerless leader, that's President Barack, confronted with unpleasant facts, they all react with shock. I only learned about it when I read it in the news. I think that's just a tactic that they've all begun to use. The crisis at the border just shows their deep divisions, with Kamala seems unaware who's making the decisions. Find the ones responsible. The VP wants to know. Well, all she really needs to do is have a talk with Joe. Issue angry statements, grumble, growl, and glower, but it's tough to blame your rivals when you're the ones in power. I suppose that leadership thought every vote's a yes, but there's no such unanimity, unless you're with the press. If you can't get the building built when you have all the tools, you may be in high office, but you only look like fools. That's Who's in Charge Here, or Where's Al Haig When You Need Him, by Tarzana Joe. That is excellent, Joe, and it will be posted, I assume, at TarzanaJoe.com. Yes. And would you tell Tarzana Johanna for me that, hey, it's going to be all right. Hey, the worst is (laughs) over now. Stop, stop. Now, uh, by the way, commission business, have you fixed your bugs? Can people come to TarzanaJoe.com or email you at TarzanaJoe at Reagan.com? It's an odd uh, bug. It seems that people with uh, Apple laptops can't reach me. Uh, So we're working on it still. That's a lot of people. I know, I know. So how do they get a poem commission? They write to TarzanaJoe at Reagan.com or TarzanaJoe at Hotmail.com. Or just wander around Tarzana till you see a guy on the street corner reading poetry and, and got that guy. It's okay. I think I heard a little bit of your work in a in a wedding poem two weeks ago, and it was oh. quite brilliant. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I, 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 never I, a I, disappointed I, customer. A no. never a disappointed customer. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Hugh. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. It's Liszt Dante. I must tell you, it's Friday on the Hugh Hewitt Show, so we do college football, the movies, and we do 100 Days of Dante. i joined by old friend Matt Anderson and Doug Henry. They are both professors at Baylor, and they are the brains behind a great project called 100 Days of Dante. It's its own Twitter handle, at 100, the number, Days of Dante, and a website, 100 Days of Dante. Now they have to tell you what 100 Days of Dante is about. Matt Anderson, welcome back. How are you, friend? I'm so good. How are you, Hugh? I'm so grateful to be on the show. It's been a long time. It has been a very long time, but it's good to talk to you again. One of my Biola Mafia, they're all around me. And Doug, good <laughs> to have you join us. I gather the Biola Mafia are overrunning the Baylor campus. <laughs> well, good morning, Hugh. They're not overrunning us, but we welcome them gladly. <laughs> All right, so Matt, you and I have done a lot of a lot of funny things over 21 years of radio. Tell us what 100 Days of Dante is, then I'll talk to Doug about who's the real expert on Dante about what we're going to do for 100 days, not 100 days consecutive on the Hugh Hewitt show, but you were doing 100 Days of Dante. Give us the setup. Yeah, so I was teaching the Divine Comedy with undergraduates last fall, and I had a great time of it. Uh, you know, undergraduates resonated with the story. They I think, got a glimpse of how reading a great text like the Divine Comedy could help them see their lives and the world around them differently. And along the way, I had this idea that I would write about Divine Comedy. And I would write, you know, one day per canto. It's a a long poem. It's divided into 100 sections. And so I, you know, I thought like, oh, I could do 100 Days of Dante. And I thought, oh, that should just be a thing. Uh, And then I was scrolling Twitter, as one does, and I saw a tweet 
about Pope Francis. And Pope Francis said this this year, uh, 2021, is the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. And he encouraged high school students, actually, to read The Divine Comedy this year. And that's when I realized, oh, 100 Days of Dante should be a much larger thing than me just writing through it. So what we have is the world's largest reading group through The Divine Comedy. Uh, we're reading one canto only three days a week. So it's a sustainable pace. So uh, we wanted to, to engage lots of people from lots of different contexts and audiences. And a lot of folks are busy and one canto a day is, is too much. So it's three days a week. We started September 8th. There's still time to catch up. We go until Easter. So we're going to end on Easter Day, which for a spiritual classic like this, is just a perfect rhythm. And we are delivering by email or podcast, or if you want to subscribe to YouTube, we have anywhere from seven to 11 minute commentaries on each of the sections of the poems by faculty from Baylor University. Baylor has been driving this project and I'm grateful to Dean Henry for making it happen. But we also have faculty from our friends at Biola, from Whitworth University, the University of Dallas, uh, Gonzaga University, and the Templeton Honors College at Eastern University. So we've got a coalition of universities that have backed this project and faculty who have been teaching this text for decades in some cases are going to walk through each of these cantos as though they were teaching it to an undergraduate audience. So whether you have you know, read this poem before on your own, you've never read it, it's a text that you think that you should read, like this is the project for you. I think it's manageable. It's really exciting. We've got 15,000 people who have signed up to do this thing in one way or another. Uh, which is a huge number. We're very excited about it. It's, it's a really cool project. Dean Henry, uh, uh, Matt just made my heart sing because he mentioned the Templeton Honors College at Eastern. That means Jack and Pina Templeton from up above in heaven are smiling on this project. Why did Baylor get involved? I think it's great, by the way. I think it's great for homeschoolers. I think it will be accessible for high school students as well. Every English teacher who is way down on by the COVID epidemic and has not been able to prepare what a ready-made curriculum to actually teach high school students Dante. So, the, so, Dean Henry, why did Baylor throw in? Well, Matt has a lot of energy and vision, <laughs> and it was easy to be persuaded. You know, I, the high school population is important. Um, it's a program that has reached, though, to, um, to the octogenarians out there and everyone in between. Part of what inspired me, uh, quite frankly, is the opportunity to contribute something that the world desperately needs. Um, you know, we, we could talk about great literature, and we could say the Divine Comedy, plenty of others have said this, is the greatest single work of literature ever written. We could make the case that cultural literacy uh, calls for attention to it. But the more fundamental and motivating thing for me, quite frankly, is that I think it can make a difference in our world. We live amidst such ugliness and uh, divisiveness. Uh, there are so many problems uh, that attend to us today. Of course, this is true of every age. It was certainly true in uh, Dante's age. And his poem offers an alternative to the, the confusion and the uh, breakdown of social fabric uh, to the ugliness of our world. Dostoevsky has this off-quoted line, I'm sure you know, beauty will save the world. Dante has a line in uh, the Divine Comedy, beauty awakens the soul to act. And I think he's exactly right. We need examples of compelling, uplifting delight that draw us toward uh, so many good things that we lose sight of in the world. And so it's exciting for me uh, to, uh, to see this as an exercise in public humanities that can make a constructive difference precisely at this moment in our history. Now, in the past on this show with Professor David Allen White or in the Hillsdale Dialogues or with our mutual friend John Mark Reynolds, I've tried to do a little Dante here and a little Dante there, but it is so massive an undertaking, it's just a glancing blow. So, uh, Matt Anderson, how are, yeah. you, how are you organizing this so it doesn't intimidate? You just said three days a week, which is great. So someone doesn't have to, and that, you, that people can catch up. That's great yep. as well. But how are you organizing it so they can just listen to 7 to 11 minutes a day and get it? Yeah, I mean, they're going to get a glimpse of it, right? They're going to get a little bit of taste. Uh, and you're right. It is very confusing. You know, Dante has all of these uh, sort of treatises on Florentine politics and who are the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. And you've got to kind of keep a flashcard around to figure out which side was which and which side Dante was on. And that can all be overwhelming. But if you can sort of just... Set that aside in one way, read the text, and encounter it as a literary 
device. I mean, the, the important thing about reading a text is getting from it what you can get from it, not what you should. And so we want to take people, say, from zero to 25 percent in their understanding in hopes of moving them to, to read a few more books and go on their own from 25 percent to 50 percent. So, you know, we've got a great set of study questions that we are providing with each one. If you sign up by email or if you go to the website every uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We have just phenomenal study questions that are written by a guy named Matt Moser at Azusa Pacific Quest University. And those are meant to facilitate deeper inquiry into the text. And really, one of our hopes is that people would read this together in groups uh, through their churches or through groups of friends. We've heard from a lot of people who have formed little book groups around this. And that's also another way to drive them deeper. So, you know, in 7 to 11 minutes, you're not going to get everything out of the text that you could get. But that's what makes it a great text, uh, that you can keep going back to it over the course of a lifetime and always learn something new from it. And so we really want to whet people's appetite and to help them see the way in which this text actually has a moral and spiritual significance for them so that they are moved to, to deepen their love for God, their love for their neighbor, and their love for the world around them. Yeah, Dean Henry, there isn't a small group in the country. That's a little Christian vernacular. People meet in small groups monthly, weekly, all <laughs> over the United States. Sometimes they're married couples. Sometimes they're men's groups. Sometimes they're in the morning. Sometimes they're in the evening. Sometimes they belong to two or three. And they always have the same problem. What do we do next? You know, they'll do a different book of the Bible. They'll do For a year, they could just do 100 days of Dante, and they would be doing a good thing. Have anyone like that turned on to 100daysofdante.com yet? We are hearing from folks all over the country just of the sort you're describing. Um, we've got one set of our uh, alums uh, up in New York who are um, organizing an online reading group. They did this at their own, at their own initiative, certainly with our encouragement. Um, I think there are a couple hundred people who are participating in that particular reading group, but far more common. We're seeing folks send uh, to the Instagram account uh, photos of their gatherings around living room coffee tables, uh, you know, small groups like you're describing that are intent upon squeezing, resting, gaining out of this great work what wisdom they can. And, I'll, you know, I'll add you, I mean, every time I come to this poem, I'm brought up short. Um, Dante writes himself into the poem. He's the author and he's a character in it. And it begins with his life in a wreck. He's lost in a dark woods. He's threatened on every side. He doesn't know what to do. He needs help. And that help arrives in the form of friends who enable him to disentangle himself from the darkness of this wood and begin to put his life back together again. And my contention is that sooner or later, all of us find ourselves at that point where Dante begins in the poem, lost in need of help from friends, we know we can't fix things, whether in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our world by ourselves. We need help from others. And that help, of course, is a measure of God's grace in the poem. And ultimately, it is God who provides the, the, the final rescue, the elevation of Dante to heaven. And us, uh, we might hope as well. But the friendship, the companionship, the encouragement that they find alongside each other is so much needed um, in all of our lives. And so there's a model here in the poem for the kind of reading community, the companionship here that these groups are themselves exemplifying. My hat is off to both of you. And Matt, we got a minute left. I'm so glad you have met at the intersection of technology and internal need. That means for literature, but also technology. 100yearsofdante.com. I've got the website right. 100 days of Dante.com. Uh, that's right. 100 days of, see, I, that's a 100 days of Dante.com. Oh my but gosh. I, it, but, but look, we built this thing because we want it to be there for at least 100 years or longer, right? This is one of the great things about the internet. Uh, this is a project that will endure and will change the website, you know, at the end of the project so that people will be able to sign up and redo it over the next year if they want. And so this is going to be a, a project that lives in perpetuity. Well, 100 days of Dante dot com. But the Twitter handle is 100 days of Dante. I assume there's an Instagram account by the same name. Congratulations, yeah. Professor Anderson, Dean Henry from Baylor University. I appreciate your taking the time with me. That's our Friday. They'll come back, by the way. I'm going to remind people of this in different segments of the show for the next few weeks, because I think it's just it's a terrific. Pro it's the at the intersection of technology and need. There is always success. 100 days of Dante. Dot com. 
Welcome back, America, using California music today because of our tribute to Pete Wilson last night. Joined now by another former senator, Pete Wilson, of course, a former senator, former Senator Jim Talent. Good morning, Senator Talent. How are you? Well, I'm fine, and I wish I could say I was a former governor, too. Well, I, 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 I want to ask you about two senators. First, I want to note the Arizona audit is over. The Maricopa County results confirmed Joe Biden won Maricopa County by pretty much the same result. I think he picked up a couple of hundred votes. No surprises here. That's behind us. That's breaking news. But the other bit of breaking news is that your colleague Chuck Grassley, with whom you serve at the age of 88, has announced he's running for re-election, and I, for one, am glad. You know, Pete Wilson's 88. We were honoring him last night on the 30th anniversary of his first year as governor of California. Those two 88-year-olds put us to shame, Jim Talent. They do. And I'm going to tell you, they're, they're like, uh, Chuck is, is what we lawyers call, and you know this better than I do, sui generis. Yes. Okay? So, I mean, he is, every time I see Chuck, it's like the same Chuck Grassley I first met 27 years ago when I got elected to the House. Who first saw, and and uh, and that, and I served with 15 years ago. The guy's incredible. He does an incredible job uh, for Iowa, and more power to him. And I wouldn't say that normally. I mean, normally I would quietly, if somebody asked me, say, you know, you need to think about it. He's unbelievable. Yeah, there's God, always God. an exception to the rule. My rule is you shouldn't be in the Senate after you're 72. The John Kyle rule. Chuck Grassley is the exception because he is one of a kind. I love the History Channel rants on Twitter, right? I love that stuff. But he also takes care of Iowa. And when he, and we're going to be talking about this when he decides to run at 94 as well, by the way. He'll make his 88 uh, uh, county drive. He works it very hard. He takes care of Iowa first. Joni Ernst can't keep up with him. But like Pete Wilson, they were drinking the water differently when they made those two, uh, Jim Talent. And I asked yeah. Pete Wilson last night, what makes a great senator? So I want to ask you with Chuck Grassley in mind, what makes a great senator? Yeah, the, the first, the, the most important prerequisite uh, is to have the heart of a servant. Okay. And Chuck does. And Pete Wilson does. I mean, you got, you, you have to be. Another really important thing, and it goes with that, is to have a dose of humble. To understand, and and and, and they both do. And then you have to you have to stay up. You have to understand what it is you need to know to make the decisions you need to make. And you have to learn how to acquire, assimilate, and retain that information quickly. And Can I tell you what Pete said last night as well? He, he told the story about crossing the chairman, Bob Packwood, on a vote having to do with the television syndication rules. And he called for a roll call vote, despite Packwood saying no. And Ted Stevens behind him said, oh, for blah, 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 you, Pete, what are you doing? This waste of... And he won, to which he yeah. said, sometimes you just have to stand up for what you believe in in the Senate. Little Jimmy Stewart moment there. Well, absolutely. And you know what? You can do that if, if you have a reputation based on performance of knowing your brief and having the courage of your convictions. In other words, if, if, if the colleagues, let's call them that, know that you're doing it because you think it's right and that, that you're, you're intelligent about how you do it, people, you, you not only don't hurt yourself in the body when you do that, you help yourself. I beat a chairman one time on a huge issue in the House Armed Services Committee. I mean, I like to think I was that way. And they knew it was, it was on whether we were going to build the uh, F-18 EMF or whether we were going to kill the program and just buy C's and D's. And it was a crazy decision that my subcommittee chairman wanted. I love him to death. Uh, but, you know, it was wrong. And uh, we beat him in, in the full committee. So, yeah, you, you just, again, it's doing what you think. is Now, if they think you're just showboating all the time, you, you get a lot of resentment. But and that brings us to today. Right. Mitch McConnell warned everyone he would not get one vote for the debt ceiling. He told everyone, go back and amend the budget resolution, do it through reconciliation. They thought he'd blink. Mitch McConnell does not blink, Jim. No, Taylor. he's the best majority leader, I think, since Bob Dole and, and my best uh, Republican leader was the best majority leader, and I hope will be again since Bob Dole. And he's right. I mean, look, it would be simple for me. I mean, I, you know, I would say, look, I'm not going to vote uh, to raise the debt limit and support this $3.5 trillion on top of the $2 trillion they spent on this, this orgy 
of irresponsible spending. I mean, and I would just I'd be very, very frank with them that that you've already spent it all. There isn't any more left. And, I, you know, if you can do this on your own, do it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go out and, and call your names. I'm going to attack the policy, but I'm not going to support it. And I think that's his attitude. It's like, look, this is this is causing this huge inflation. It's, it, it's burning the credit of the United States. And it's not buying anything that people care about. And I'm not going to support it. I, mean, I think that's his attitude. It is his attitude. And, and Nancy Pelosi blinked yesterday. They're going to take the continuing resolution back, strip the debt limit out of it, begin to amend the budget resolution so they can use a reconciliation process to do it with 50 VUN votes, including the vice president. Good for Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy. And good for you, Jim Talent, for joining me on a Friday. It's not your regular day. I appreciate that. I'll be right back 